I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of the kinds of things I've been able to write about because I've put myself in a particular situation. So um, my second book is called Coyotes. And when I was traveling with hobos on the rails, I was telling uh, these guys at lunch about this. The hobos have a hierarchy. And among, among hobos, if you travel and work, you're at the top of the ladder, OK? That's, that's admirable. If you travel and don't work, well, that's OK. At least you're better than the person who neither travels nor works and you know fishes for hamburgers and the trash cans out on the sidewalk. So that would be a bum or a local homeless person. And these, the railroad tramps looked down on them. And I, I was meeting lots of Mexicans on the rails. And it seemed to me they fit the first definition. But the, the hobos I was with, um, according to their worldview, the Mexicans weren't even on the ladder. They were just Mexicans. And I thought, whoa, is that, is that messed up? I mean, um, th this is your, this, they fit your, in fact, they work harder than most of you guys do. Um, but you don't obviously say that because uh, you don't want to get beat up. And, um, but I thought if I could um, be accepted enough to travel with Mexicans, this is something I haven't read about. And this could add a layer of understanding to, you know, the news reports I was seeing on TV at the time of the Border Patrol popping the trunk of the old car, right? And four people blinking in the bright lights of the cameraman's camera. And uh, I just thought that's very superficial. There's a more interesting story here about what it's like to be one of these most recent immigrants. So. I went down to Arizona. I found a farm workers group that said, yeah, we, we could use some help. We need somebody to teach English out in these orchards where uh, th this group tried to organize undocumented people. So I started off that way. I met a bunch of guys. I could never pass, well, maybe in certain circles of Mexico City, I might pass as a Mexican, but not in most of Mexico. And. Uh, uh, so I was very straightforward about who I was, what I was interested in doing, and I ended up traveling for a whole year with different groups of Mexicans, both um, around the U.S., crossing the border. And this passage is from uh, down in Mexico. It turned out that a lot of the guys I met at the orchard came from the same valley in the same part of Mexico. There are all these patterns of workers going to different parts of the country to do particular jobs. So. Um, this is a group of guys in the orchard. We had just crossed the border. Um, I'm third from the left. It was a difficult crossing. They look kind of sad because um, some of them were beat up by Mexican policemen. It's not illegal to leave Mexico, but the police still shake them down. And we'd had a hard time. Um, uh, but this is the town where they come from. It's called Aguacatlan de Guadalupe. It's in Querétaro in central Mexico. It's a really pretty town, and they all seem much happier there. And uh, there's this very old-fashioned shop where people make, you know, in English, American English, we say warachis. You know what those are, those sandals, those woven leather sandals? They actually use recycled tires. That seems to be a theme in today's talk. Um, recycled tires, and this is the same guy. This is this picture's from three years ago in the... Um, 90s when I was there, he was also making, same guy was making warachis. And this passage takes place in this shop with guys I had traveled with from Arizona up to Idaho. And some of them I'd been to Los Angeles with, too. One day, several of us were seated around the warracheria of Tiberio's brother Ignacio, that's Ignacio, watching him and his ass assistants cut and sew the leather for sandals. Teo asked Jesus, that's what they called me. How do you say it when a girl's wearing perfume? What do you say to her? I like your smell. Is that it? I like the way you smell? Yes, yes, that's it. I like the way you smell, he interrupted. He, he was always trying to improve his English. Well, you know what I said to my girlfriend there one night? Jesus had dated a number of American girls, none of whom spoke Spanish. I shook my head. We were driving in the owner's car, that old Cadillac he gave us. And she smelled good, so I took her real close like this, and I said, baby, I like the way you stink. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I burst out laughing, and Jesus explained it to the others. In Spanish, you use the same verb for smell or stink, and Jesus hadn't appreciated the difference. Did she explain it to you, I asked? Yes, but she was mad, said Jesus. <laughs> you know, she taught me some other words, too. <laughs> Be nice, she used to say. That's when we were in the car, and you know. Tiberio made the appropriate body language to describe what they'd been up to. Oh, we made some big mistakes up there. Remember Tiberio and the Burger King? They asked if we wanted everything on it. Yes, I said, but no mustache. <laughs> what, she asked. No mustache, I said. I thought I was saying mustard. Another, they don't like, these guys, none of them liked mustard. Another time he had suggested to his girlfriend a dinner at the Pussycat, the Pizza Hut, he meant to say. And yet another time he'd asked the foreman if he could borrow the fuck you from the trailer. <laughs> what? said the foreman. The fuck you? said Jesus, a bit nervously. He knew the phrase had a bad meaning, but thought it also meant vacuum. <laughs> the words sounded identical to him. So did eyes and ice. These confusions had gotten him into lots of trouble, he said, offering extra explanations to the others in the room so they'd understand what he was telling me. One of the most rapt listeners was a middle-aged man squeezing rivets into straps of leather for huaraches. Oh, English, he said. They say it's the hardest language in the world. No, Chinese is the hardest, offered Ignacio, also middle-aged. As these men debated the point, I realized something extraordinary, extraordinary was happening here. These older Mexicans were listening closely to men barely into their 20s. Age was the traditional determinant of who listened to whom in rural Mexico. But here, emigration to the states had thrown the, had the town turn, turned around. I meant to say that more slowly. Emigration to the states, because of course there it's people leaving, right? Had the town turn around. The young guys were heading out earning in a week up north what their fathers would toil months for. They returned to constitute a higher class of men, wealthier and more experienced, if less wise. Father Cano, he's the uh, local priest, was right. In ways both subtle and obvious, emigration was setting Awakatlan on its head. So um, one of the cool things about the internet is, so that's early 90s. Last year, I got this picture through my website, and um, this that guy Tiberio I had been with was like 22 years old at the time. That's him on the left now, that middle-aged guy, and this is his son. So, um, uh, and they're in Mission, Texas. He still doesn't have uh, legal papers. He still comes and does all kinds of uh, work in in the United States. So, okay. Um, the last book I'm going to tell you about today is, um, I guess, the book for which I'm best known. Uh, I moved to New York, let's think, in the mm, late 90s, yeah, mid-90s, and um, noticed in the newspapers all these headlines about record numbers of people going to prison, record numbers of prisoners, and that the incarceration had a very racial quality. Um, uh, 90% of the prisoners in New York State are, are people of color, and 90% of the officers, because of where the prisons are located, are Caucasian. So you've got this really messed up system, and it was just growing by leaps and bounds. And I thought, how could I write about that? Well, if you're Wilbert Rideau, you write from painful, lengthy, firsthand experience. Um, I thought briefly, how could I how could I become a prisoner? And I thought there was something sort of superficial about that whole idea. And also, if you could get out, you weren't really a prisoner, right? If you could say, I've had enough, can you let me out now? Um, that kind of makes you a different kind of prisoner. Um, but I thought prisoners have written most of the best books about about prison. I wonder who else understands it well. And I thought, you know, uh, the officers who work there and are so easily stereotyped in movies and on TV as big, uh, thick-headed brutes. Uh, I bet they know a bit more than they're given credit for. And I bet that's a pretty interesting job. And I wonder if, this, if there's truth to the stereotype. And I wonder if there is, if people arrive that way, or if prison changes them, if there's something about the job that, that changes not just 
you know, that changes anybody who's, who's wearing that uniform. Um, I got an assignment from the New Yorker to write about a family of correction officers in upstate New York, um, and I was so excited. And then the state said, no, well, that's very nice, but we're not going to let you into those prisons. And uh, I thought that was, that was wrong. This is the second biggest employer in New York State after Verizon is the prison system. It's a $2.5 billion um, uh, annual budget in New York State, and they act like it's um, the CIA, uh, which it's not. It's a place to put people who've been convicted of crimes. And I, I thought, you know, that's not fair. I, uh, I should be able to see what's inside. So it took me a while. But I, I, uh, I took the civil service exam. I did not lie. I uh, was not asked if I'd written any books. Um, but I said I'd worked for a couple newspapers. I'd also listed the other odd jobs I'd done, the Stanley Kaplan test prep, the uh, Spanish tutoring, apartment uh, manager. I taught aerobics briefly. <laughs> back when my shoulder was good. Um, anyway, it took me three years, but I got hired. Uh, and uh, this is my graduating class at the uh, Albany Training Academy. Um, I'm in the second row. There's only one person, I think, smaller than me, and he's in the front row. You can see him, but he was a whole lot tougher than me. Uh, we didn't know where we'd be sent until uh, the last day of our seven-week training academy, and that's when we learned we'd be sent to Sing Sing, which by great good fortune is um, less than half an hour from where I live in the Bronx. So I said, I'm going to try and use this training, see if I know, if I can figure out how to do this job. And so, uh, so began almost a year as a state, uh, New York State Corrections Officer. This is Sing Sing. It's, it's on the east banks of the Hudson River in Westchester County, New York. Um, it's famous from old movies in the 20s and 30s, James Cagney movies. Um, Warner Brothers filmed so many movies there, they ended up donating a gymnasium that they built on the property. You can't see it. it it's down the hill. Um, the first cell block at this prison was built by inmates who quarried the stone themselves and then built their own cage, essentially. Um, what you see now are the two biggest cell blocks. The one on the left is called B block, and the one on the right is called A block. And these are gigantic warehouses for human beings, and I worked in um, B block on the left. Uh, so my job, uh, I carried a whole bunch of keys, like 10 pounds worth of keys, and um, I would let people in and out of their cells. On my floor, there were uh, 56 inmates on each side of my floor. And when you come into this building, it's got a little door and then this giant space above you with all these cages. And it looks like a mink farm uh, writ large, just, you know, gone crazy. And it's noisy. The people there are... Um, uh, are, are not happy about being there, and to them, I'm like uh, the substitute teacher. I'm um, an object of ridicule and bullying if they can get away with it. So can they get away with it? Well, yes and no. Um, they can walk up to me, as they did my first week, and say, hey, CO, and touch me on the shoulder, which is a violation of the rules, and pretend it's a CO. And his friend goes like this, and I'm like, I jump back a foot, or a yard more like it, because I really think he's going to punch me, and then they laugh and walk away. So is that, a, is that a, a violation? Yes. Can I write them a ticket? Yes. Did I get hurt? No. Will anything happen to them? No. Because bad stuff, much worse stuff than that goes on there. So you learn that the rules won't really help you unless it's serious stuff. And uh, you learn you've got to toughen up a little. And the longer you're there, it's like, it's truly, it's like being in a bad public high school. The longer you're there, the less people test you, and the more they'll go along with you just because they recognize you. Um, time in prison 
is status. So that counts not just for inmates. The old timers have the highest status, but it counts for the officers. You can, you can be a puny little officer who's been there 20 years, and, and they'll all do what you say, as long as, as long as you're not a jerk, of which there are a few. 